Amen. Good to see everyone again. I'm Caleb Akinosho. I'm from the Tempe Church, and I'll be preaching tonight. And I want to thank Brother Corbin for giving me the opportunity to preach. So now we're here in Acts chapter number 20. Just to get everything in context, look at, let's look at verse 18 where it says, <clears throat> And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I, I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mine and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I am bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that the bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto me, my, unto myself, so that I might, might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. So we're here in this passage of, or in this part of the chapter in Acts chapter number 20. This is getting close to the end of Paul's missionary journey or his ministry. And what's going on is that Paul ends up calling the elders of Ephesus because he knows that he want, his desire is to go to, to Jerusalem and preach. And he doesn't know what's going to happen to him when he gets to Jerusalem. And it's even at the point that he's ready to die. And that's where I get the title of my sermon from is in verse 20 because I want to focus on a specific phrase where it says, but none of these things move me. And that's the title of my sermon today is, but none of these things move me. Now, Paul didn't know what was going to happen to him, and he, but he wasn't really worried about it either because he knew he had that goal in mind and he, was, and he had a, his mind set on what he wanted to do. Now, obviously, I don't know if this was really God's will because they, were, they kept constantly trying to tell him, hey, don't go to Jerusalem. But in the end, God did use it to minister onto people. Now, what does that word move mean? Because every t you know, oftentimes when we think of the word move, we think of just taking something from one place to another or something along those lines. But oftentimes move has a more or less a, an emotional, uh, it can be emotional in the sense that one of the definitions of moved is this. It says to dislodge from a fixed point of view as by persuasion. And then it says to prompt action, rouse, anger, moved her to speak out. That's one I'm using it in context. And then it says to arouse the emotion of affect or stir. stir. So what Paul is saying is that none of these things are going to change his mind. None of these things are going to move him from what he believes or what he's going to do. And the same thing goes with us is that we as Christians, we shouldn't be easily moved. The Bible says, be no more children being tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. God wants us to be people who are not moved by just things in this life. And that's what I want to specifically focus on today is just not being moved away from the things of God. And there's many things that you can be moved, you know, in this life that can move you away from the things of God. But I only want to focus on four specifically today. Now, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter number four, Mark chapter number four. And while you're turning there, I'm just going to read a quick verse in Psalm uh, Psalm 55, verse 22 says this, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. So God's goal is that righteous people are not moved, that he wants righteous people to be steadfast in their beliefs and the things that they do and not just waver back and forth. Now, I had you turn to Mark chapter number four. This is a parallel chapter with Matthew 13 and Luke 8, and it's the famous story of the parable of the sower. Now, if you look at verse 3, we're going to go in the context of the parable of the sower, and then we'll break it all down, because I have two points that I want to take out of this, this part of the scripture. But it says in, verse, in Mark 4, 3, it says, Here can, behold, there went out a sower to sow, and it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprung up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, 
And because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and it did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some thirty and some sixty and some an hundred. So from this story or from this parable, Jesus has given us three different types of ground, and then you can also say the one that's fallen by the wayside. So the one that's fallen by the wayside is that it's pretty much someone's trying to plant a seed, and that seed ends up not even getting a chance to grow. And then you have the stony ground where it, it, it ends up being planted to a certain extent. It falls on stony ground, but it's not, it doesn't have a good root, so therefore when the sun comes out, it ends up burning it up and it can't it's not able to grow then you have the third type where it's where the seed ends up growing but it's growing in thorns the thorns end up choking it and then because the thorns end up choking it it's not able to bear fruit and the last one is the seed growing on the good ground where it says that it yielded fruit and then it eventually reproduced so those are the four types of ground that the bible talks about in this parable now I want to go over these four types, but like I said, only two I'm going to really emphasize or make a point about. Now, look at verse 13 in Mark 4, verse 13. The Bible says, And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? How then will ye know all parables? So Jesus, because the disciples didn't really understand what was going on with the parable, and oftentimes they really didn't understand. So Jesus had to expound the parables more and more. And in this passage, we see that that's what Jesus ends up doing. And he says, the sower soweth the word. So that seed is also known as the word. And it says in verse 15, and it says, And these are they by the wayside, when the word is sown, but when they... Had, have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. So now breaking this down, the seed that falls on the wayside pretty much doesn't, it doesn't obviously end up growing. It doesn't end up doing anything. And in, as a matter of fact, Satan, or in another passage, it says the birds of the air end up taking the, the seed before it can even grow. Well, and if you look at the parallel passage in Luke 8, it says, it talks about the word being, or the seed being the word of God. And that when you go out soul winning, you plant those seeds. But sometimes people don't end up, they hear the gospel, but they end up not getting saved. Because what happens is Satan tries to take that word from them. And if you read the account in Luke 8, it says, lest they believe and, they, and be saved. So the first part or the first type of ground is talking about someone who's just totally unsaved, someone who... Uh, isn't going to heaven, but then the rest of the grounds, I believe, are talking about people who are saved, and if you look at the next one, look at verse 16, it says this, we're talking about the stony ground, it says, and these are they likewise, which are sown on stony ground, who when they heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, so endure but for a time, afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended, so we see the stony ground, and this is where I get to my first point, is this, is that what we shouldn't be moved on is by persecutions. And the Bible, or the Bible is saying that those on the stony ground, they end up growing for a little bit, but then what ends up happening, that afterwards, they, when affliction and persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. So this, this seed and this stony ground isn't able to grow. Why is that? Well, spiritually, it's talking about people who eventually get saved, they may get in church, but the problem is when hard times come in their Christian life, then that person's not able to serve God. That person, as soon as something bad happens, they get out of church and they're offended. Now, we shouldn't be moved by persecution. You know, the Bible says in many different places, you don't have to turn there. Where I, where I want you to turn, so keep something in Mark chapter number 14 because we're going to come back to it, but turn to Hebrews chapter number 11, Hebrews 11. But the Bible often, many times in the Bible, it says that we as Christians are going to be persecuted, that things are going to happen in our lives where we end up getting persecuted. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.10, it says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Now, why shouldn't we be moved? Well, the first reason we shouldn't be moved or 
uh, by persecutions that God's able to deliver us out of persecutions. We see that Paul saying that, you know, he went through a lot in his life, but God was able to deliver him out of all of those. And I believe when he's talking in Second Timothy, that was later on in his life. And he's saying that, well, later on, you know, through all the things that went on in my life, God was able to deliver me from these things. But then he says this after saying that God delivered him out of these all. He says, yea, and all that will g live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So if you don't want to get persecuted, then don't live for God. Because if you live a godly life, then you will get persecuted somewhere in your life. And if you haven't gotten persecuted yet, you're eventually going to get persecuted sometime in the future. You know, I went a long time without getting persecuted for a while, and then, you know, things ended up happening in my life where, you know, my family was against me going to a church like this, and, you know, they've heard pastor got banned from all these different countries, and they weren't happy about that. So it's like, and, you know, they didn't really want to have anything to do with me because they knew I went to a church where the pastor preached against homos and preached <laughs> what the Bible says. But just saying that, that you'll have people in your life where that's going to happen. Family may not want to have anything to do with you because you're trying to serve God or even your job. You know, I've heard of many stories where, like, for instance, let's go to the way back machine. Back in 2016, Pastor Jimenez, he ended up preaching against some homos. Like, there was a bunch of homos that ended up getting killed in Orlando. Just giving you a story if you guys didn't know the story. But he ended up preaching against those, those guys back, you know, the homos in Orlando that got killed. Well, he got a lot of flack for that. He ended up having like a great, I mean, it was a huge amount of protesters come to his church and start protesting. And I ended up going up there because it was like at the same weekend as the soul winning marathon. And I ended up going because pastors like anyone who's in this area go up there so you can support Pastor Jimenez. But when I got there, I mean, there was like. I, I mean, obviously, I'm not going to count homos because I don't care about them that much. But, <laughs> but there's like five, I, I mean, I would say it was around 500 or more that were out there protesting, protesting his church. I mean, they were all around, and I mean, it was a lot. And they were just doing a lot of weird things. Like when you came in, they would take pictures of you after the service. They took pictures of you when you went to your car. They ended up taking pictures of your license plate. So they were doing a lot of just weird stuff that homos do. But anyway, the reason I'm bringing up that story, story is this, is that um, a lot of people ended up leaving when that happened. When Pastor Jimenez got all that flat, there were, I mean, I think around 40 people ended up just leaving his church because of that. And we don't want it to be that when persecutions arise in our life that we leave. You know, we haven't had a protest in a while, but I mean, just seeing how things are going, and like especially this year, and we don't know what's going to happen the next few years, but it just seems like, you know, things are getting worse and worse and worse. And you want to not be moved by, you know, when those things happen, when persecutions arise. Now, I had you turn to Hebrews chapter number 11, because I want to give you a person that wasn't moved by, by persecution or affliction. The Bible says in verse 24 about Moses, it says, By faith, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So we see here that Moses was a man that when afflictions came up in his life or when things came up in his life, he chose rather the, to suffer afflictions with the people of God. And as believers, we have that choice we want to make that, hey, if you believe what the Bible says, if you want to stand with the church, if you want to stand with the pastor, then you have to make that choice not to be moved when persecutions or afflictions arise. And that's what we can see with Moses is that Moses made that choice to rather suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. So he had, instead of enjoying all the things that were going on in Egypt, he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God. Why is that? Look at verse 26. It says this, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the, the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. So it says in verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Moses was able to see afar off. He was able to see things that people probably didn't see at his time, meaning that he was able to see that the things of God matter more and suffering with the people of God, suffering for Christ is more important 
than the treasures you have on this earth. And Moses was able to see that. That's why he was willing to suffer affliction with the people of God. So why am I bringing this up? Is that we shouldn't be moved when, you know, whenever the time comes and our church is persecuted, whether it's by the world or you're persecuted by your family, you know, you should still just be, still serve God. Because if you get to that point where you, you stop serving God, then you're not going to get those rewards that you could have when you actually took a stand and tried your best to serve God. Now, another thing um, is this, and I'm, you can go back to Mark chapter number four. And while you're turning back to Mark chapter number four, I'm going to read John chapter number 16, because this is Jesus speaking to his disciples right before he's crucified on the cross. And he says this, behold, the hour in uh, John 16, 32, it says, behold, the hour cometh, yea, and is now come that ye shall be scattered every man to his own and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the father is with me. And he says this in verse 33, these things have I spoken unto you that in me ye have you might have peace in the world. You should have, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus even tells us that we're going to have tribulation in the world. As a Christian, things are going to go on in your life. Tribulation is going to come on, uh, come up in your life, persecutions, but you need to be of good cheer because he says, I've overcome the world. And in Christ, you know, we're all overcomers. We've all overcome the things of the world. And even if, you know, we lose a lot, or we even get killed for the, the sake of Christ, at least when we get to heaven, that's something we can get rewarded for and something we can glory in to say, hey, you know, I did what I could on this earth to serve God. And you're not going to have any regrets. Now, I had to go back to Mark chapter number four, and I'm going to get to my second point, which is, uh, and it's found in verse 18, where it says this, and they, and these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of, the, of other things entering in, choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. So my second point is this, is that we shouldn't be moved by the things of this world. Now, we see this as the second person, like the, uh, the third ground, or I guess you can say the third ground, but it's the seed that was sown among thorns. And what happens with the seed that's sown among thorns is this, is that ends up growing. But then what happens in verse 19, we see in the cares of the world, th this world and deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. So you have Christians out there, you know, they get saved, they start growing in the Lord, they start trying to serve God. But what ends up happening, the cares of this world end up making them not fruitful, making them not soul winner, making them not uh, being able to be used by God. And we can see that happen a lot. You know, I think about, for instance, the cares of this world. It's like your job. Say if your job has you want to, they try to make you work on Sunday. And I'm not against people working in between services on Sunday, but you got to figure out a way to make take a stand to say, hey, you know what? I'm not going to work on Sundays if I can, you know. And because many people, what ends up happening, I've seen this a lot, is that they'll start working on Sunday and, they're, you know, the job's just like, oh, you only have to do it for a few weeks. Well, that few weeks ends up taking, you know, becoming a few years where you never end up getting off that shift. And what happens? You start missing church. And something I've noticed with people, it's a lot harder to get back in church than it is to get out of church. It's really easy for a person to get out of church because it doesn't really take any effort. You just don't come. But, but people who end up trying to get back in church, it's a lot harder because they don't know what people are going to think about them when they get back. And then they just get lazy, you know, and it's just like, well, I can just watch it on YouTube. But the good thing is, is that the YouTube channel keeps getting deleted. So now you're like forced to get the church to go to church because you can't find the YouTube channel anymore, my friend. So, but... Just saying that is that you don't want the cares of this world to move you out of God's will, out of the things of God, and get you to stop serving God. And not only that, you know, I think about the news, for instance. I have phases where I'm like really, I'm, I'm like watching the news, and then phases where I don't watch the news, and then phases where I watch it and don't watch it. So I'm in the phase right now where I don't care about the news whatsoever. I literally don't know anything that's going on right now, and I don't want to know because I just don't care. <laughs> you know, it's that simple because it's all it's usually the same thing. They're just trying to like 
they're blasting the same thing. I mean, I'm sure if I was to turn it on right now, they're going to be talking about coronavirus. And if they're not talking about that, they're going to be talking about the elections. And if they're not going to be talking about that, they're going to be talking about the Kardashians or <laughs> the, the, what's that called, the Mike Tyson fight that happened recently. And the ones who watched it <laughs> know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and just things like that. They're just going to be talking about junk, things that don't really matter. And I've noticed this, that sometimes the news can stress you out. Now, there's some people who can watch the news, and it's not like that big of a deal. But I'm not one of those. I'm one of those people that's, there are times where, like, I will say, yeah, it doesn't affect me. But then you start, you know, when you're getting blasted by the same thing every day, then, yeah, it does eventually start affecting you. You start thinking about it. I remember back in, like, the 2016 elections, I was just like, I was, I'm not really into politics or whatever, but... I remember listening to the news while I would drive, and I remember, like, how can, I was thinking about, because this was around the time that they were trying to figure out who the Republican candidate was going to be, and this is like, you know, Ted Cruz, uh, the, one of the Bushes, because, you know, Bush has always run for president, and then all these other guys. So then I was like, wow, Trump is actually, you know, ascending the ranks, and I'm like thinking, I'm like, I don't want this scumbag to be, <laughs> be our president, but, you know, eventually became our president. And then same with Hillary, you know. It's like I'm hearing what, who they're choosing for the Democratic candidate, and I'm like, wait, you're, you're serious that you're going to have Hillary as, <laughs> you know, the person who wants to be president? So it's just like things like that stress me out. And I was just like, man, it's going to stink regardless of whoever's in office. So I remember during that time, I said, you know what? I'm not going to listen to this anymore because I don't want to get stressed out about it. And I eventually turned it off. And then after that, I was happy for a few years. And then I just slowly got back into the news. And then that was when the next election came up. And then I jumped right back out of it because I was like, I don't want to care about these things. I want to worry about the things of God because the, thing, the, the things of this world are always going to be, be the same thing. And it's always going to be here. I mean, what? Ten years from now, we'll, we'll have a new virus. COVID, what, 30? <laughs> it's probably like COVID 30, 31, whatever. So there, things are not going to really change. And you don't want those things to move you. Because I've seen people even get into, like, conspiracy theories. And once they get into conspiracy theories, you know what they become? They become preppers. And then what, pr what do preppers end up doing? They end up moving to, like, some, you know, empty part of the country where no one else lives. And then they live there. But I don't believe that's God's will to be in some, like, desert part of America, like in Idaho, because I think that's where most of the preppers end up going, to my knowledge. But they end up going to Idaho, and <laughs> it's just like they end up, I don't believe that's God's, unless you're going to, I believe, Shield of Faith Baptist Church in, I in Boise, then I don't believe just going to <laughs> Idaho is God's will, where you're just sitting there waiting for the end of the world to come, and it doesn't even come. I'm sure it's probably a prepper that was there back in like the 1940s during World War II, just like waiting for the end of the world, and then it never ended up coming, and he's probably, he probably like never got back into church. But just, I'm joking about that, but obviously... But what I'm saying is that those things can stress you out. I've seen people look and get into conspiracy theories, and it's just like some, you're like, okay, that's cool. But then others are just like, come on. <laughs> you know, like, how dumb can you be to like, believe that? But it ends up getting them out of the will of God. I mean, many, I'll, I'll use the example of flat earthers. We, have, we had a lot of flat earthers that ended up coming to our church, and they were going soul winning and doing all this other stuff, but then trying to preach the flat earth behind the scenes. But anyway, <laughs> but what I'm saying is this, is that they, they ended up, uh, a lot of them ended up leaving just because the flat earth was more important to them than the things of God. His pastor preached against it so hard that it ended up ma making most of them run away. But now go with me to Matthew chapter number 16, Matthew 16. While you're turning there, I'll read a quick verse, famous verse in 1 John chapter number 2, verse 15. It says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So if you heard that, the Bible says, If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It's not saying that God doesn't love someone who's worldly, but what it's saying is this, is that if you have the love, if you love the world, then that room that God is supposed to have is not in you. You don't have that room or that love for God. Because you're putting all the junk of the world. It says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. If you want to serve, if you, if you don't, if you want to be able to better serve God, then you shouldn't worry about the things going on in this world. You shouldn't let the things of this world move you, and you'll be in God's will, and you're going to abide forever. Now, I had you turn to Matthew chapter number 16. Look at verse 21. 
This is another part of the story where Jesus is telling his disciples about how he's supposed to die. And there's just a few quick things I want to pick out of pick out of here but in verse 21 it says this for that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day then Peter took him and began to rebuke him saying be it far from thee Lord this shall not be unto thee but he turned and said unto Peter get thee behind me Satan Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things of God, but those that be of men. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. And what Jesus is saying is this, is that Peter's just saying something stupid to him and to Jesus Christ. So Jesus rebukes him and he says the thing, you're not, sa you're savoring the wrong things. He's saying you're not savoring the things of God, you're saving the things that be of men. And you can equate that to the things of this world. And he says if anyone's going to really follow him, if you're going to follow Jesus Christ, then he says if you're going to come after me, you need to deny yourself. You need to deny the cares of this life and says take up your cross and follow him. You know, there, there's a time and place for everything. You know, there's a time to relax. There's a time to, you know, chill out, have fun. I'm not saying that we should just always be soul winning. But there's a time to do the things of God. And, you know, if you're just on YouTube all the time and then you're not praying or you're not reading your Bible, then there's a, there's a disconnect there. There's not a balance in your life. You know, you want to make sure you seek the kingdom of God first and do the things of God first. And the easy way to do that is this, is that, you know, if, as soon as you wake up in the morning, you pray, if you have time, you read your Bible, or you try to read your Bible throughout the day so that at least you're starting off on a good note and starting off on a spiritual note that, you're focusing on the things of God and hopefully that day it's not, you know, that you're not going to be focusing on the things of this world because, you know, you, you already have your mind set on the things of God. Now it says this in verse 26, for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? It says in verse 27, for the son of man shall come in the glory of his father with angels and then he shall record every man according to his works. And this is uh, just making this point is that if, if you want to get re re ah, rewarded by God, then you need to have the right mindset. You need to have the right priorities and do the things of God and not just let the things of this world move you away from the things of God. Now, I want you for my next point, I want you to go to Matthew chapter number six, Matthew six. And while you're turning there, just to finish up Mark uh, four, it talks about the good ground and it says, and these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some, four, some thirty fold, some sixty, and some in hundred. So if you want to be someone who's on that good ground, you're going to hear the word, you're going to receive it, you're going to serve God, you're going to do what you can in your Christian life. And the Bible says you're going to bring more fruit. You're going to get more people saved. You're going to you know, get rewarded by God. So now my first point was this, is that we shouldn't be moved by persecution. We shouldn't be moved by affliction. We shouldn't let things in this life that uh, hinder us from serving God or move us away from serving God. You know, we need to stand strong when afflictions come in our life. And not only that, we shouldn't be moved by the things of this world. We shouldn't let things in our life move us away from our focus on God. But not only that, we shouldn't be moved by uncertainty. So that's my next point. And I, like I said, I had you turn to Matthew chapter number six. I'm just going to read a few quick verses. In, Matthew, in, sorry, in Proverbs chapter number 27, verse 1, it says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. So sometimes I think people think too far ahead in the future. And, you know, nothing's wrong with planning. But if you're just, like, planning everything, then <laughs> it may be a problem. Because, like, for instance, I thought 2020 was going to be a better year. I was just like, oh, I'm going to do all this stuff. It's going to be great. And for me, it ended up starting off really rough. It didn't start off as a good year. I had a lot of, I had a family member pass away. My old pastor, he passed away. So, and then, you know, everything with the lockdowns and so on and so forth. So it didn't really work out too well for me. And you know what? We can, some people could be moved by what's going to happen in 2020 or 2021 where they're like, oh, well, you know, if 2020 was this bad, then what's going to happen in 2021? But you know what I say? Just don't worry about it. I believe that if you start stressing things, 
stressing out about those things, then what's going to do? It's just going to move you away from the things of God. And, you know, for instance, a prepper, you know, the prepper can be like, oh, they're going to vac vaccinate all of us and they're going to mandate it. And what is he going to do? He's going to run to Idaho and he's going to get out of church and he's not going to serve God. Well, we don't want to be people like that. You know, let's wait until it comes. <laughs> you know, don't, don't sit there and start freaking out about something that's not even that, that, that didn't even happen yet. Now, I had you turn to Matthew 6. Look at verse 25, Matthew 6, 25. The Bible reads, it says, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body. What ye shall put on is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment. Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them, are ye not much better than they? So what it's saying here in this passage is that, is that God looks out for animals. I mean, he lets animals, he feeds animals, he does whatever he can to keep them alive. But, he, but Jesus is saying this, is that aren't we better than animals? And I agree with that. We are better than animals. So we worry about things that are going to happen, and then a lot of the time they don't end up happening. And sometimes we need to just put it in God's hands. And I think sometimes people just don't think about that. They start trying to do their own thing, and then they don't let God's will work. You know, for instance, things are getting worse and worse and worse, you know, as time progresses. But I do believe that God will spare those who are righteous. You know, he did it in Sodom and Gomorrah. He did it in other chapters of the Bible or other stories of the Bible. And, you know, I think he can do the same thing now that, you know, say if there's a natural disaster. Obviously, if you need to evacuate, evacuate. Don't sit there. <laughs> you know, if we have an earthquake and they need, we need to evacuate, just evacuate. But I'm saying God can protect his people when, when that, that time comes. And we don't have to worry about, you know, va mandated vaccines or whatever or anything else that's your fear because God, if, you know, God can make it where if he wants it to happen, it can happen. And he'll, you know, he can use it to try you or he can protect you from whatever's going on. Now look at verse 27. It says, which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto a stature? And what and why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which, is, which, today, is, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye, need, ye have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So God knows our needs. God knows what he needs to do for us. And... What the Bible says is this. It says, uh, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So when you seek God first, when you're not moved by things that you don't even know what's going to happen, then God, and you seek God, and you, you seek his righteousness, you're doing the things of God, you're trying to live the Christian life, then all the things that you need are going to be added onto you. And I think God knows what you need or how much you need to be able to be sufficient for you to serve him. It says in verse 34, Take no thought for, tomorrow, for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So like I'm saying, you know, you don't have to worry about the things that are going to happen tomorrow because you don't know what's going to happen. And all you have to do is just let God <laughs> let it happen and just trust in him and have faith in him and he'll be able to take care of you. I mean, there are many things we can't control in this life and that's why we just have to let thing, let God work so we don't have to worry about those things. Now, go with me to John chapter number 6. John chapter number 6. My last point is this, is Something that I've been thinking about, because it happens, especially at a church like ours, we have people that come and go. And I think this may, you know, it, how should I put it? I think this is something I was just, I've been thinking about, and it doesn't have like a, it's not in line with the other points, it's a totally different point. But it's talking about, my thing is, is we shouldn't be moved when either people leave our church or some pastor goes off the deep end. So, why I'm getting into this is that, there are a lot of pastors that end up 
trying to fellowship with our churches and you know they group up with us and then eventually they turn out to be a weirdo and then you know they get called out and then whoever likes that pastor is heard about it well the thing is is this is that we shouldn't be moved by that because I, I know for instance I'm thinking about someone in particular where a few years ago Pastor Anderson called out someone who you know he was preaching or whatever and someone in our church didn't like it and they ended up leaving but my problem with that is this, is just like if the person's preaching false doctrine or they're doing something wicked, then it's just like whatever if the person calls them out. And then not only that, if you don't even go to the guy's church, why do you care that much? <laughs> you know, so it's like I don't understand that. Because if you're at Faithful Word, then yeah, it's, it's great to listen to other pastors. I listen to other pastors. You know, I listen to other preaching, even uh, pastors that may not even be new IFB. Sometimes I'll listen to some of their sermons. But, you know, if pastor calls them out, I'm like, well, I don't go there to church, so I don't really care that much. But there are people out there that like that, where when pastor calls someone out or some other pastor that we know calls a pastor out, then they get all hurt and they get offended, and then they end up leaving. And to me, that just doesn't really make any sense. Now, in Romans 6, uh, verse, or 16, 17, the Bible says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them that cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. So if someone is going out and preaching false doctrine, then, and they don't want to repent about it, then you mark that person, you avoid them. And that's how it goes. So if some pastor out there that you like, that you listen to, is preaching some weird thing or weird heresy, and they've been called on the carpet on it, they don't want to repent, then the best thing to do is not have anything to do with that pastor, especially if you don't agree with what they're saying. You know, Say if some pastor is just preaching some like oneness or something, and then pastor calls them out on it. And if you don't, even if you like the guy, then you need to unlike him. <laughs> you, know, you just need to not like the person anymore. So, because like I said, I've seen people where that happens, and then they end up getting out of church because they were offended that their pastor, the pastor that they like, got called out. And I, I personally don't understand that because, like I said, you don't go to their church anyway. You know, I feel sorry for the church members that are blinded by their pastor because I believe a lot of the time, some, or a lot of these churches where it happens, some of the people are saved, some of the people are not. And they end up just getting caught in the mix of it and they don't know what to do and they just end up staying. But we're already at a good church, so that's something we don't really have to worry about. So we shouldn't be moved if some pastor gets called out by our pastor, some other pastor. But not only that, we shouldn't be moved, like I said, by people leaving the church either. Because people are going to come and people are going to go. I've been at Faithful Word for roughly almost four years. And I've seen many people leave and I've seen many people go. And especially this year, I've seen a lot of people leave. And sometimes it hurts, you know. You, you're buddies with these people, you're friends with these people. And there's a different spectrum of, or there's a spectrum of how people leave. You have the people who end up getting kicked out that are heretics or that done something wicked. And that's fair game, you know. If they get kicked out, you, should, you shouldn't have anything to do with them. And you're like, you, I'm sure, you know, you'll think to yourself like, man, you know, I like that person, they did this, but you should just leave them alone. Because they, this is what pastor, he said this years ago, and when he said this, it's like, it made so much sense. He said, anyone who's gotten kicked out of Faithful Word Baptist Church deserves to be kicked out. And I agree with that, 100%. Anyone who's been kicked out of Faithful Word you know, for some, something that they did or something that they said or, you know, preaching false doctrine, they deserve to be kicked out. This pastor, like, I would say 99% of the time, talks to the person in private, sees what they're trying to, what they're talking about, makes sure that he, he's, you know, if they're ready to get kicked out, that it's justified before bringing it out publicly. He doesn't sit there and just kick someone out on, on a whim. He's like, I don't like you, get out of here. I don't like you, get out of here. No, pastor's not like that. Pastor's a reasonable pastor. Same with Brother Corbin, you know, if he's kicked out, if he's kicked out anyone here, you know, I'm like, <laughs> iffy about saying it like that, but, because I don't know who's been kicked out, and then the people I think have been kicked out, I'm like, yeah, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> uh, he's the same way, he's reasonable, he's someone you can talk to, and He's not going to just kick someone out on a whim. He's not going to just kick someone out for no reason. They, usually he talks to the person. He understands where they're coming from. He tries to make sure, hey, I'm, I, I have reason to kick this person out. And he ends up kicking them out. And the thing is, is that we shouldn't worry about that. Because if someone does, if they have space to repent and then they don't repent, it's just like, well, you kind of get what you deserve. If, especially if pastor is giving you time to repent, then you shouldn't sit there and worry about the person who got kicked out because 
it's their own problem. It's their own fault. So that's like that side of the spectrum. But then you have other people where they just end up leaving. I know a lot of people ended up leaving our church during the COVID-19 thing, uh, COVID-19, you know, when the church closed down so earlier this year. And when we, uh, I guess, brought the church back, you know, we started going back to church where the church opened back up. You know, some of the people just didn't end up coming back. And I'm thinking of one person in particular that I was really good friends with, and he ended up leaving, and he didn't tell anyone he left. And, you know, I felt bad about it. I was just like, man, you know, it stinks. I like the guy, and he ended up leaving. He didn't tell anyone. And, you know, I wish he was still back in church because I don't know what he's doing. I don't know if he's serving God. I don't know if he's, you know, just eating chips off his chest. I don't know what the guy's doing. But, you know, in the end, there's nothing I could do about it. If the guy's not serving God, then that's his problem. That's not my problem. That's not going to get me out of serving God. It's not going to get me or stop me from soul winning. That's not going to stop me from doing the things of God. Now, I had you in uh, John 6. Look at verse 62. It says this. G- Jesus is talking to some of the Jews, and he says this. What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. Now verse 66 is where I want to focus on. It says this, for that time... Many of his disciples went back and walked no more with them. So Jesus was talking to a large group of people, and then he said something that they just did not like, and then they end up just leaving him, and they don't, you know, they end up departing from Jesus Christ. Well, it says in verse 67, Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Now, I like how Peter responds, and he says this, Then, said Simon, then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that, the, that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So Peter's like, I'm not going anywhere. Because Peter has that right attitude and that right idea that, yeah, if he's offended or he may be hurt that someone left Jesus, that he's like, well, I'm still going to serve you because I know who you are. I know that you're the living God. I know that you're, you're, you're the Christ. So I'm, I'm going to still follow you because you have the words of eternal life. Now, obviously, Faithful Word Baptist Church isn't, isn't eternal life, but we do preach the words of eternal life. And what I'm getting at is this, is that Peter had the right attitude. I think it's the same attitude we should have, that if someone ends up leaving, then we're still going to a good church. We're still trying to serve God. You know, we're still going soul winning, and we shouldn't be moved when someone leaves. We should just say, hey, you know, this church is a great church. You know, many people have moved here for, you know, from different parts of the country just to serve God. So why would you let someone who doesn't want to go to the church affect your Christian walk? You might as well just serve God and say, hey, you know, I pray that the person ends up coming back, but if they don't, I'm still going to serve God with my life. I'm still going to do the things of God. Now, go with me to 2 Timothy chapter number 4. 2 Timothy chapter number 4, and that's where we're going to wrap up. 2 Timothy 4. And when you get there, look at verse 8. Now, I believe this is around the time of, or the end of Paul's ministry. And he's just going through a few things. And he's, he's, he's uh, writing to Timothy, just telling him, you know, giving him a few last things that he wants him to know. And it says in verse 8, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, where the Lord... The righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all men also that love his appearing. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. Verse 10, it says, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Cretius to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. So what's going on is this, is that, Paul had people with him. He had Demas, and Demas loved the world. He loved the things of the world. He ended up forsaking Paul, and he ends up going to Thessalonica. And he says, Cretius to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatian. Cretius and Titus, I don't know if they, I don't think they were doing anything wrong, but they just weren't with Paul. And what I'm getting at is when people leave, it's just something that you don't have to worry about. You don't have to worry too much about when people leave. Now look at verse 11. It says, Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me 
for the ministry. Now, Paul says this, that Luke is the only one with him. So what the application I want to make with that is, yeah, you're going to see people come and go. You're going to see people come to the church. You're going to see people leave. People like Demas who love the world. They don't care about the things of God. Well, just let them leave. You know, people like that, don't worry about them. But then he says, only Luke is with me. So Luke stayed with Paul. And like I said, the application is that is, well, cherish the people who remain in church. Be thankful for the people that are still here. You know, and sometimes it helps you grow with those people. You know, people that I was really close to that ended up leaving. Well, then, you know, new friends come, come to be about, you know, I start going soul winning to someone else. We become friends, you know, and that can happen. So it gives you more opportunity to be and fellowship with people you may not always fellowship with just because you're hanging around with your best buddy. You know, and since your best buddy left, now you have someone else that you can hang out with. And then just think about all the people who have stayed at the church and just be thankful that they're still here. Say, you know, you could say, oh, well, you know, such and such has been at the church for 10 years and I'm glad to see that they're still here. I'm glad to see that they're still serving God. I'm glad to see that they haven't left. And then we even see here, Mark, it says, take Mark and bring him, bring him with thee for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Now, if you're familiar with the story of John Mark, Earlier on in Paul's ministry is this, is that John Mark went with Paul on one of his missionary journeys and then just said, uh, you know what, this isn't for me. And then he ends up turning around and not following with, with uh, Paul anymore. But then later on, if you read Acts chapter number 15, Mark wants to follow them again. And Paul is like, no, I don't want to have anything to do with Mark. He, forsake, he forsook us before and now I'm just done with him. But then Barnabas is like, no, we should take him. We should have, uh, you know, we should take him on our missionary journey. Well, the contention between the two got so bad that Paul and Barnabas ended up departing. And they were on the missionary journey for many years together. But they just, they had such a big argument about what was going on with Mark that they just ended up departing from one another. Mark ended up going with Barnabas and then Paul ended up taking Silas, and then that starts Acts 16, where from Acts 16 on, he's with Silas. You don't really hear too much about Mark and Barnabas. Well, I believe, and you know, I strongly believe that 2 Timothy is written towards the end of Paul's life. And Paul is saying, take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. So what is this saying? Is that Mark departed from him, so we can use the application of Mark left the church. But then eventually, Paul's saying that, hey, this guy is not a bad guy. This is someone that's profitable to the ministry. So what did Paul end up doing? Well, Paul forgave him when he came back. And that's how we should be if someone ends up leaving the church. Let's just say they leave for, you know, because they just care about the things of this world. They end up getting a job. It makes them work on Sundays. You don't see them in a while. But when they come back, just act like they never left. You know, I can think of people who have been kicked out of our church for, you know, things that they that are deserving to be kicked out. Someone got kicked out for fornication and they got kicked out for a while. They came back. You know what the whole church did? We forgave them. We put them back in the fold and we act like it never happened. And I believe that's what Paul's doing here that, hey, Mark left, but now he's back. He's profitable. He's doing he's trying to serve God. Leave him alone. So, you know, don't sit there and hold someone's past sins against them. Someone who's been kicked out of the church before, if they've been kicked out, then forgive it, forget it. You know, if the pastor forgives the person, then you should do the same. You shouldn't just hold something that the person did over their head because I just don't think that's right. Now it says this in verse 12, Antichicus have I sent to Ephesus, the cloak that I left at Troas for Corpus, when thou comest, bring with thee the books, but especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou ware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. So Paul is talking about Alexander the coppersmith, and he doesn't want to have any fellowship with him. He said he did him much evil, and he says, beware of him. He greatly withstood our words. So applying that to the church, you have someone who was coming to our church. They did something evil. They did something wrong. And you try to talk to them. You try to get them back in line. They don't want to do it. They don't want to repent, then the thing is, you just have nothing to do with them. And what does Paul say? He says, the Lord reward him according to his works. So if someone's wronged you at the church and they left, you know what you do? You just let God deal with it. You know, I don't think, some of the memes are funny when <laughs> someone gets kicked out of church. But sometimes just like, you know what, let God deal with the person. And God will punish the person even more 
then we can punish them with memes and with other things. You know, and sometimes there are people who just leave our church that we just say, hey, you know, let God deal with this person. Once they're gone, they're gone. And that's how Paul dealt with Alexander, and I think we should do the same thing. You know, we should just say, hey, you know, mark that person, avoid them, and let God deal with them and let God punish them. And oftentimes, God does punish those people because they're not right with God. And we may not be able to see it because they left the church, but I do know God does punish these people because the Bible says that he will uh, punish people who do wickedness. So now in verse 16, it says this, At first my... At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsake, forsook me. I pray God that it may, be lay, it may not be laid to their charge. And it says in verse 17, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I, deliver, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So Paul's just wrapping up to say that God's going to deliver you from whatever you, you know, he delivered him. And I believe God will do the same for us when we serve God, when we're not moved by things that happen in our lives. And he's going to pre uh, preserve us on this heavenly kingdom. When we get to heaven, we're going to see all the things we did and we're going to get rewarded for it. And that glory is going to be there forever. Now, all that to say this is that, like, uh, like I said, it's just next, this year was kind of rough. <laughs> I mean, it was just a weird year for, I think, everyone. And next year, it could be the same thing. It could be worse. It could be better. We don't know. It's a lot of uncertainty. But one thing I can say is this, is that, that the purpose of the sermon is to say, hey, even if 2021 isn't that great, then let's not worry too much about it. Let's not be moved by those things. The best place to be in church, or the best place to be when you're uncertain about something is in church. Because, I mean, there's no other place you can go. I mean, the things that God are the most important thing you can do in your life. So why get out of church or why get out of God's will because you don't know what's going to happen in 2021. You don't know who's going to be your friend in 2021 or you don't know, you know, what, what's going to happen with your job. You know, we should be people who are not moved by those things. We should be people who are steadfast in the things of God, in the Bible, in the Word, which people who are soul winning, you know, on a regular basis so that we can be able to better serve God with our lives. And then when things come, you know, God's able to deliver us. The Bible says in Matthew, I read this earlier, but in Matthew 6, it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto, the, unto you. So if you seek God's righteousness, even in times of uncertainty, even in times where, where you don't know what's going to happen, God will still be able to bless you. God will still be able to, to help you out. And, you know, he's going to help you out in ways that you, you don't even know or that are unimaginable. So why, why get out of his will? There's no point in getting out of his will. It's best just to serve God, you know, to the best of your ability. And, you know, God will bless you for it. So let's pray.